day, my friends. Here we are at Menopause University, <laughs> tackling a unit on the three big diseases of estrogen deficiency, which are heart attack, osteoporosis, and Alzheimer's disease. This is video number 306, and it's the third to last video in the unit. Starting with video 300, I've been presenting all your management options in the non-hormonal categories. And the last few videos have covered diet, lifestyle, exercise, vitamins, minerals, supplements, and herbs. And today we'll discuss the non-hormonal medication options. Now one of the big distinctions about this category of options is that it is not only for prevention as so many of the others are. Non-hormonal medications can actually offer treatment. In other words, they belong in the fixin' lane. They are designed to be used once you already have the disease. So let's delve into this topic and see what's available to you. Consistent with what I've told you throughout this unit, you'll find this information in the individual chapters for these three diseases in my book, regardless of whether you have the first edition or the second edition. The great thing about this video is that it elucidates some comparisons. Back in video 181, you learned that there are three non-hormonal medications for preventing a heart attack. They are the statin drugs, aspirin, and antihypertensives. The statins are used mostly by people who have high cholesterol, high lousy LDL, a strong family history of heart attacks, or have already had a heart attack or stroke themselves. Statins have a long list of both side effects and risks ranging from pesky problems to dangerous problems. Here's the whole list of undesirable things that can happen as a result of taking a statin drug. Headache, difficulty sleeping, skin flushing, muscle aches, tenderness or weakness, drowsiness, dizziness, nausea or vomiting, abdominal cramps, bloating or gas, diarrhea, constipation, skin rash, memory loss, mental confusion, high blood sugar, type 2 diabetes, nerve damage, muscle inflammation, and liver damage. That's a pretty long and significant list of undesirable that two of the items on the list have to do with your memory, memory loss, and mental confusion. And that's because, as I explained in the Alzheimer's unit, statins decrease cholesterol production in your entire body, including your brain. And this is unfortunate because your brain thrives on cholesterol. The ultimate result is that statins actually increase your risk of Alzheimer's. Nonetheless, statin drugs are some of the most commonly prescribed drugs worldwide. You could probably get a doctor to prescribe a statin drug even if you didn't need one. The guidelines for using them are very, very lax. I guess the guideline makers for statins accept that most people will not adopt the diet and lifestyle measures that could take place of statins. Moving on to aspirin, you know that you don't need any kind of approval or prescription to take it. It's over the counter and it works by thinning your blood. And its most common side effect is GI upset, gastrointestinal upset. And the third category of non-hormonal medications for preventing a heart attack is the antihypertensives. High blood pressure is one of the most common diseases on earth and it does not produce symptoms. Well, it does but not until it's too late. It's the silent killer. So if you don't control your high blood pressure, you are very likely to have a sudden heart attack or stroke. There are many antihypertensives. Most cause very few or no side effects, and they are cheap and very easy to get. 
So if you choose to reduce your risk for a heart attack with any of these options, you will be quite successful. They are well suited for prevention of a heart attack. And even if you already have heart disease or plaque buildup in your arteries, you can take any of these for intervention or fixin'. They all span the gamut. Then, in video 224, you learn that there are a bunch of non-hormonal medication options for osteoporosis, too. You know I'm a big fan of charts, and in that video I created this colorful chart for you. Now, I'm not going to rehash all this in detail. If you want the detail, you'll find it in video number 224. This is why you'll save yourself a lot of hassle by just watching all my videos in order. But I will highlight certain things that pertain to our discussion today. There are basically four different categories of non-hormonal medications for osteoporosis. The bisphosphonate serums, the non-bisphosphonate serums, an estrogen plus serum hybrid, and an antibody. The distinguishing feature for all these medications is that unlike estrogen, they have the ability to replace the bone you have already lost. So they fall into the intervention and fixin realms of capabilities. The bisphosphonates are the most well-known and commonly used medications for osteoporosis. They are very reliable in building bone and reducing your risk of fracture. And they have only a few side effects, which include reflux esophagitis, musculoskeletal pain, atypical fractures of the femur bone, and osteonecrosis of the jaw, or ONJ. Reflux is easily avoided by taking the bisphosphonates as directed and refraining from lying down or eating in the hour afterward. Musculoskeletal pain is uncommon. The atypical fracture of the femur heals like any other fracture. And osteonecrosis of the jaw is extremely, extremely rare. None of these side effects or risks is anywhere near as bad as the spine or hip fractures that they prevent. And that is the very key to considering the benefits and risks of any medication. The advantage of the bisphosphonates is that you can take both estrogen and a bisphosphonate together. The estrogen stops your bone loss and the bisphosphonate replaces your lost bone. The other serums, raloxifene and tamoxifen, are only for women who do not take estrogen. And they cause the same side effects as estrogen deficiency. So you replace your bone, but you have more hot flashes than such. The estrogen plus serum hybrid is good for your bone, but that's all. It does nothing for your heart or brain like estrogen does. And that's because it contains a lower than sufficient dosage of estrogen. And it does not relieve your symptoms of menopause. And finally, the antibody definitely decreases fractures, but has a whole different range of side effects. All of these medications can serve as intervention or fixin'. There is nothing wrong with taking one for early osteopenia when it can make the greatest impact in getting your bone density back to normal. Now, the interesting thing about all these drugs is that, is that there are so many of them. Yet, yeah, it's very difficult for you to get them. And it's not because they are incredibly expensive or dangerous. It's purely because they are given according to the guidelines for treating osteoporosis. And the guidelines for osteoporosis are all designed to let you break. Most of the guidelines indicate these drugs for women who have already had fractures. Isn't that crazy? Why in the world would you withhold a medication that prevents a fracture until after someone fractures? It's just backward. So you have this huge dichotomy between the rampant use of the statin drugs versus the stingy use of the bone building drugs. I always tell women to pay for these drugs themselves if their insurance doesn't. No quantity of money is worth a fracture from osteoporosis that will leave you a cripple for the rest of your life. Then, 
In video number 277, you learned that there are many categories of medications marketed for Alzheimer's. They include stimulants, memory and attention enhancers, antidepressants, and recreational drugs. None of these can do a thing once you already have Alzheimer's, yet they are all used as treatments for Alzheimer's. In other words, they are marketed and used for intervention and fixin' even though intervention and fixing of Alzheimer's is impossible. They all have side effects, high cost, and trade-offs in terms of what they do to your cognition. But doctors are very quick to prescribe these pharmaceutical options and patients are very quick to take them. And that's because once you show signs of Alzheimer's, all you have left is hope. None of these items is as effective at preventing Alzheimer's as your lifestyle. But again, people are very slow in changing or improving their lifestyles. This is why I presented them as a fantasy as bizarre as the tale of Alice in Wonderland in video 277. So what you have is a whole bunch of options in the intervention and fixing realm for all three of the big diseases, but, to act, but access to them varies greatly and so do their capabilities. If we put these items on our trusty prevention, intervention, and fixing chart, it looks like this. Isn't it odd that this category of non-hormonal medication options is the only one that is well suited for intervention and fixing once you already have these diseases, but that there are so many other options in other categories that can actually prevent the diseases. The key to success is knowing where each management option falls on the prevention, intervention, and fixing scale. The biggest mistake women make is using an option for something it simply cannot do. If you try to use an option to achieve something it plainly cannot do, you will be the casualty. Just know your goals and be sure to choose options that can accomplish them. Okay, next week I'll present the second to last video in this unit and it will face you with a cold, hard reality. So don't miss it. Please schedule a consultation with me at menopausetailor.me for anything you need. You will get so much more out of it than you can possibly expect. And please subscribe before you leave here today. And then follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time, bye! <laughs>